Christ arise and put your armor on. Strong in the strength which God supplies through his eternal Son. Strong in the Lord of hosts and in his mighty power. For in the strength of Jesus trust is more than conqueror. Stand then in his great might with all his strength endued and take to arm you for the fight the panoply of God from strength to strength go on wrestle and fight and pray tread all the powers of darkness down and win the well fought day leave no unguarded place no weakness of the soul take every virtue every grace and fortify the whole but having all things done and all your conflicts past ye may or come through Christ alone and stand entire at last thank you, you may be seated I changed a few of the words going along because it's not quite like it used to be written, but uh, that's all right. Let's take our Bibles and turn over to the book of Acts tonight. Wonderful, exciting passage, a passage that shows us what is the impetus to get the church moving. A passage that helps us to understand when we don't obey what God does to make sure that we do, in fact, obey. Last week we were looking at the first two verses of Acts chapter 9 verses 1 and 2, where we find that the church, having remained at Jerusalem uh, and refusing to get out and do what God had told them to do, begins to have persecution. After the death of Stephen, there was that little interlude of chapter 8 where we saw the story of the Ethiopian eunuch, but the persecution has started back in chapter 7 or the beginning of chapter 8 uh, as we move the church out of Jerusalem into Judea, Samaria, and ultimately to the uttermost parts of the earth as our Lord Jesus Christ had commanded back in chapter 1, verses 8 and following. And in verses 1 and 2 we read, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if any be found of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Before we read the portion of text for tonight, let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power and for the fact that you mean business with your people. When you tell us to do something, you expect us to do it. And we pray, Father, that you will help us each to understand the responsibilities that you have given to us in proclaiming the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ in our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. From this church, Father, you have raised up many who have gone forth into other parts, not only of this state, but of this country, and then around the world. We thank you for them and for their faithful testimony. For those who are on the mission field today, carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who have never heard. We thank you also, Father, for the privilege we have of witnessing here in our own community and in the various communities in which we work and have contacts. So, Father, we pray that as we look into your word tonight, you will help us to understand what it is that you would have us to do. Father, that was the question that Saul asked as he was struck down on the road to Damascus. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Help us not to be so focused on our own petty things that we fail to understand what you want us to do. So, Father, we pray for your blessings upon this, the going forth of your word tonight, that it would not return unto you void, but that it would accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto 
you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know that last week we talked that about the fact of the many different things happening between Acts 8 and Acts 21, which is where we pick up the story about Philip again. And so a lot of things are going to be going on in this brief period of time as Saul, who later becomes the Apostle Paul, uh, is called, commissioned, and empowered to do what God wants him to do. We saw that when God wants his people to spread out and they disobey, he forces the spread because disobedience leads to other worse sins. We saw the illustration of the people prior to the flood in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 6 where God had told them to multiply and fill the earth. They didn't do it. Uh, they instead stayed in one spot and tried to build a tower to heaven. We find that there is another illustration in Genesis chapter 11, another illustration in Hebrews chapter 11 of those who obeyed and when they moved out, God blessed them for their faith. We saw the illustration of Israel failing to learn the principle of the Babylonian captivity. They failed to obey and so God took them captive under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar and looked at the passages in Jeremiah that uh, dealt with that issue. It seems that God's people tend to delay and not to learn what God wants them to do and think that because of their ignorance or because of their slowness of obedience, God will overlook it. But God does not overlook our disobedience because all disobedience leads to greater sin. When you know the will of God, when you refuse to obey the will of God or delay obeying the will of God, which is disobedience also, it will always lead to sin because sin grows, sin corrupts, sin spreads like leaven as the Apostle Paul explains to us. And so unless it is cut out, unless it is purged out, unless it is cast away, it will begin to grow in your life and it will spread to other people as well, just like the flu or some other contagion. And so God in his mercy, not merely in his anger, but God in his mercy will bring us under his chastening hand and cause us to obey his will or else if we will not, he will take us home. That is, he'll kill us. No football team will ever permit a player to continually grab the ball and run across the, the end zone of the opposing team. The coach will very soon pull that man off the field. The same way with our Heavenly Father. As we play ball for our Heavenly Father, so to speak, he expects us to do our part in the game which he has put us into at the time of life and in the period of the game that he wants us to play. He expects us to be playing with all of our heart, with all of our strength, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and doing the things that he, as our coach, has instructed us in his playbook, which is the Bible, the Word of God. So if we disobey, it leads to greater sin, and if we come under greater sin, we come under greater chastening, and God will either force us to obey or he will take us home. He'll pull us off of the playing field. God always uses evil that happens to us, we noted this last week, for good on behalf of his elect. Romans chapter 8 verses 28 through 39 make that very, very plain and we'll not read those again. But then we noted one other thing. Just by obeying God does not mean that we will escape trouble. Believers who are actually living for Christ not just talking about living for Christ, but believers who are actually living for Christ are always to expect persecution to arise at any time. You don't know when it will happen. Your obligation is merely to live for Christ, to be obedient to him, to walk by faith, to trust in his power to enable you to fulfill the will that he has revealed in his word. We saw that we should never be lulled into a asleep by a false sense of security, and we should never trust the world or apostate religionists to be our friends. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 and following, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Paul lived a godly life. Paul lived a faithful life. Paul lived a diligent life. He expresses that in verse 10. But he moves right into verse 11. Persecutions, 
afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But listen to this last phrase. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. And then he reminds us of how this applies to us. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Are you supposed to follow them just because they are escaping problems? No. He goes on in the next verse. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. We saw that final word of encouragement in Revelation chapter 2, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Don't be afraid. The God whom we serve is bigger than the world. The God whom we serve is eternal and has promised us a marvelous eternity. The world is very, very short. Time is truncated. It's passing away. Our goal should be to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is why John, in Revelation 2, writing the words of our Lord Jesus, says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. When we look at it from the eternal perspective, how paltry it seems, this persecution and suffering of this world. Most of us here are fairly old. There are a few young people here. But as we move toward the end of our life and as we look at the remaining days that God has given to us, we should not be afraid of what will happen. But instead, we should focus with all of our hearts and souls and minds on serving Jesus Christ and doing what he wants us to do. At our Spencer family Christmas several weeks ago, as we gathered actually a week or so before Christmas so that as many as possible could be there and so that I could be back for the services here, one of my daughters, the one in fact who was here this past Wednesday evening with her husband and two little boys, shared with us something that I thought that is a great insight. She had gone to a Christian Medical and Dental Association meeting and they had a special speaker a family that had adopted two uh, boys from a war-torn zone in Africa. And they were not babies, they were teenagers when they adopted them. And someone raised the question, well, it wasn't that pretty difficult to do? I mean, to get a couple of young men like this uh, who've had all kinds of horrible experiences and who've already gone through so much trauma that it's just, uh, you know, it'd be very hard to raise them. And he had replied to that question with these words. Arriving at death safely is not the goal of life. Arriving at death safely is not the goal of life. Unfortunately, most of us as Christians in America have made that our goal, arriving at death safely, so that everything goes along very smoothly, everything goes along without any problems or difficulties. We want to arrive at death safely. Dear friends, that is not the goal of life, certainly not the goal of life for the Christian, the Christian who is willing to boldly risk everything for Jesus Christ. God calls us to be warriors in a battle. That's why he has equipped us with the necessary armor in Ephesians chapter 6. As we look at the believers in the book of Acts, we can see clearly that their goal of life was not to arrive at death safely. 
They acted wisely. They didn't stand around and say, come on, arrest me. God was accomplishing a purpose by moving them out of Jerusalem so that they would carry the word of God elsewhere. There are biblical principles that relate to hiding one's self in times of persecution. The Apostle Paul himself was let down over a wall in a basket at Damascus where he had originally gone for the purpose of persecuting Christians. We begin with thoughts from last time by looking at wisdom for our times and what the prudent man does when the pressure and persecution arises. Does he simply sit around weeping and gnashing his teeth and biting his fingernails and trying to hide his gold and silver and make sure his bank accounts are okay and make sure that the stock market is going to be okay and wondering if he's going to lose money in that and you know, wringing his hands. We have a few very interesting statements in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 22.3 A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. But the simple pass on and are punished. That verse is essentially restated in Proverbs 27, verse 12. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. God inserted that verse twice in the scriptures to give wisdom to the young man the book of Proverbs is the book of wisdom, so that we might know how to live. It's to teach us to be prudent men and women, to teach us to be wise in what we do, to be thoughtful and insightful, and to exercise forethought based on scripture, so that we might obey God for as long as he gives us life. One other verse very similar to that in the book of Amos, chapter 5, verse 13. Therefore the prudent shall keep silence in that time, for it is an evil time. We'll let you think about that for a while as we move into our text for tonight. Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 6. And as he, that is Saul, who will later become Paul, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said unto him, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Powerful passage. Very brief, but any encounter that is a divine encounter will be filled with power, and if, as it is in this case, be filled with the terror of the Lord. The book of Proverbs tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Paul thought he was smart. Paul thought he was bright. Paul thought he was wise. Paul thought he had a great training. Paul thought he was on God's business. Paul thought that he was going to accomplish it in the power of the flesh. He was a young man. He was a man with determination. But he had a divine encounter. Because God had to instill something in Paul's heart that he did not have. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the holy is understanding. Dear people, do you have the fear of the Lord? 
The book of Proverbs tells us also, the fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Do you have a fear of man? Or do you have the fear of the Lord? Or do you wobble back and forth between the two? And part of the time you fear men and you fear what's going to happen to you and you're afraid of what somebody's going to do to you. And then part of the time you trust in the Lord and you don't worry about what men are going to do. Where is the balance in your life? Does it tilt toward this side of the scale? Or does it tilt toward this side of the scale? If we understand who God is and what his care and concern for us is, we will not have the fear of man. If we understand the chastening hand of the Lord, we will not have the fear of man. There are two things over on this side of the scale that will always outweigh the fear of man. That is God's love and care and concern for his own on the one hand, and that is the righteous chastening hand of God when his children disobey him. It will help us to understand our love relationship to him. It will help us to understand our position in submission to him as our authority, our heavenly father, the one before whom we must give an account, the one who will chasten us when we disobey. Now we keep those things in mind as we move through our passage here. Paul followed the letter of the law. He was a Pharisee. He was the son of a Pharisee. He was somebody who was determined to do what the Mosaic Code commanded. He made sure, as we see in our text, that he got legal authority and religious authority before he started his quest. He didn't just want it orally, he wanted it in writing. He got it in writing so that if anybody ever questioned him, he could pull out the, the parchment that had been given to him by the chief priests and demonstrate that he had authority. He wasn't just there to do his personal crusade against the Christians. He got authority first. He made sure that this was a heresy that the Sanhedrin also wanted rooted out of other locations as well as at Jerusalem. But he made sure that the areas that he went were under the jurisdiction of the religious leaders. He was going to the synagogues. He couldn't run around all the streets and enter into houses in Damascus like he had done in Jerusalem. He went to the synagogues because those were under the authority, almost like a consulate or an embassy is under the authority of the nation to which it belongs. He was going to synagogues in Damascus. Secret believers didn't bother him. Did that ever occur to you? He didn't care about people who were Christians, but who never opened their mouth for Jesus. They didn't go to the synagogues and say boo about Jesus. They weren't out in the streets passing out tracts and witnessing. Hey, as long as they're secret believers, they are making absolutely no impact. Are you what might be called a secret believer? In fact, as people have known you over the years, or even those with whom you've come in contact at various times, would they know that you are a Christian? That you're a vibrant, fervent Christian? That you're a Christian who is unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation unto everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Or put another way, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Paul didn't care about the secret believers. He wanted to find the ones who were making an impact in the synagogues. He wanted to find the ones who even at an extended distance from Jerusalem 
were causing this heresy of Christianity to spread. And he wanted to make sure that it got rooted out. What really bothered him was the people who were open about their faith in the context of the synagogue. He was zealous for the purity of traditional rabbinic Judaism. He didn't care about the Samaritans or the Gentiles becoming followers of a, what he considered a false religion. And we talked about why he didn't go to Samaria last week. He was a fanatic about rabbinic Judaism being polluted. Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciple of the Lord, went to the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of the way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Did you notice that Paul had no mercy on the women either? I think he understood the principle that has been articulated this way. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. It's primarily the women who would be inculcating the values and the belief system to the next generation. It would be through the children that the Christian faith would either skyrocket or be nipped in the bud. Paul did not try to accomplish his mission on his own. Did you notice he wasn't on the road to Damascus by himself? He was the leader, but he took with him others with all the necessary manpower, for example, to block the entrances and the exits to the synagogues, to slap chains on the identified believers who would try to make a run for it or who would resist arrest. He wanted to make sure that all the bases were covered. He didn't know how they would react when he suddenly showed up at the synagogue. He had manpower with him. Paul was a, a brilliant man. He was a strategist. He understood what he was doing. He wasn't stumbling along in the dark, hoping he would find somebody out there. He had a specific purpose. He had specific goals. He had specific authority. And he had people who knew their business of arresting other people. The men that journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Saul had apparently heard of the direction in which the Christians were spreading in the synagogues, north along the trade routes. From Jerusalem to Damascus, along the ancient road that went directly through Shechem, that is Sychar, where Jesus met the woman at the well, which is in the area of Samaria in general, it would go north in sort of a northeasterly direction toward the point, the tip of the south end of the Sea of Galilee. Then it would cross over the Jordan River and again head in a northeasterly direction toward Damascus. Now that would have been probably the shortest route to have taken. But Saul didn't go through Samaria. Saul was a religiously pure Jew. He would not defile himself in that way. And that's why he didn't pursue Philip at the Samaritan revival. He didn't care whether Samaritans became Christians. After all, they were already anathema to him. So who cares what they do? They could have stood on their heads and believed in poached eggs. It wouldn't have bothered Saul at all. And he certainly wasn't going to defile himself that way. He could have gone over to the coast if he had gone west and gone up the coastal route and then cut back across. But that, of course, is a very long route to do it that way. If Paul had gone from Jerusalem to Jericho, which is probably what he did, he would have crossed over the river at that point and gone up the eastern side of the Jordan River. That road joined the first ancient road that I just described a minute ago at the bottom of the Sea of Galilee and then headed northeast toward Damascus. So if you look at a map at the time of Christ, if you find Sidon on the coast, as you're running up the coast of Israel, find Tyre, which is to the south, and Sidon, which is to the north, and then go directly west, you will run into Damascus. Damascus is about 60 miles inland, but you have to cross the Mount Hermon range to get there, and Mount Hermon is 9,232 feet above sea level. 
Any of those roads are rugged roads, but the road that Paul or Saul probably took was about 140 miles long. 140 miles is a long way, especially if you're doing it on foot or on horseback. It's rugged terrain. It's the blazing heat of the Middle East. I hope you get the picture that Paul was a determined man whose goal was to obliterate the Christians. Now let's talk for a minute about the prudent man trying to hide out and the vitriolic drive of the persecutor. 140 miles over that kind of terrain is where some of the Christians had gone. Notice that even traveling a long way from Jerusalem was not enough. Do you remember what we read back in chapter 8, verses 1 and following? Saul was consenting unto the death, that is, Stephen. At the time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. They had tried to travel a little distance to start with. But by Acts chapter 9, they fled as far as Damascus at least. In Jerusalem, it says, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. You see, Jerusalem was under the jurisdiction of the chief priests. So he could go house to house in Jerusalem. He couldn't do that in Damascus. That's why he got letters to go to the synagogues in Damascus. And that's what brings us to verse 4, which introduced Philip to us. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere, preaching the word. Now this past week I drove down to downtown Washington, D.C., and that's a, a journey from here of about 150 miles each way. The trip down took me about three and a half hours. On the way back I encountered horrendous traffic, so it took a little over five hours to get back. And that was driving in a very comfortable car on relatively smooth roads. Not all of them, but some of them. Now stop and think about this for a second. When you think of Paul's journey to Damascus, think of the distance between Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. Then think back to the days of George Washington when they did walk and when they rode horses. Now remove all of the trees along that route and add some very bad, rough, rocky roads and throw in a few mountains. Now combine that thought with the hottest, driest time the east coast of the United States has ever experienced, multiply it by two, and you will have a general idea of the average climate and conditions that Paul traveled through just to catch and kill Christians. This man was driven. Just putting a long way between yourself and the persecutors does not necessarily guarantee your safety. But there is something else that does guarantee your safety. Proverbs 29, 25 again, I quoted it a moment ago. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. If you're walking by faith, you can walk in safety. The fear of man will always bring a snare. And you will be miserable. You will be upset. You will always be wondering and worried what bad thing is going to happen to you next. The fear of man brings a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. It's a great promise, folks. Proverbs 21, 31, the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. It doesn't matter what you do. There were so many Christians who were totally freaked out over Y2K. And they bought massive amounts of all kinds of things and thought that their computers were going to crash and that the world was going to come to an end and all this kind of stuff when that second hand ticked past midnight in Y2K. And what happened? Absolutely nothing. God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Fear is the opposite of faith. Fear is a curse that comes on us from the devil and from the flesh. 
Faith is how God has called us to walk. That's 2 Timothy 1, 7. Proverbs 28, 1. The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. When we have fear in our lives, there is frequently also sin. And that causes us to have the fear that makes us flee. The wicked flee when no man pursueth. But the righteous are bold as a lion. When you are walking by faith, when you are trusting the Lord for your protection and your provision, when you are eradicating sin from your life by being obedient to the word of God and confessing sin that does come, and being cleansed by the blood of Christ and the washing of the water of the word, the righteous are bold as a lion. Important lessons for us to learn as Christians. Paul was on his way to catch Christians, but you know something? Those were Christians that God didn't want to be caught. The Lord Jesus Christ stood in the way as their protection to fulfill other plans that he had. The plans of the wicked do not always happen according to the way they want them to happen. What we need to learn to do is discern the will of God and walk in his plans, and that always includes living by faith. He doesn't cause us to live by fear. He doesn't want us to live in disobedience. He wants us to walk by faith. But remember this also, genuine faith always brings glory to God. And glory to God can take many different forms. Sometimes that glory to God results in incredible victories and in deliverances. But sometimes it results in death, as it was in the case of Stephen. So don't be surprised if result two comes your way. The victory part is the part that we like to hear and the part that we like to experience Hebrews 11.32, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and the prophets. And my next page didn't print. <laughs> so I'll turn over to Hebrews chapter 11, because I know what else I was planning to say. <laughs> but I can't quote that entire passage. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 32. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, escaped the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. That's the part we like to hear. But those who are listed next are also considered heroes of faith. These are men and women who suffered, and yet they are no less valuable, no less heroes than those who have gone before them. Listen to the next part. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. We might say, okay, if I can't have the victories, at least give me a quick death. Help me to die in peace. Arriving at death safely is not the goal of the Christian life. Arriving at death safely is not the goal of the Christian life life. Don't let me be tortured. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, that is, they had no money afflicted, tormented. Now look at the divine commentary on those people. 
of whom the world was not worthy. This planet wasn't worthy of those people who suffered those things. They were so far beyond what this world deserved to have in its presence that the world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Oh, how we love our little cracker box houses. How we love those refrigerators stocked with all kinds of goodies. How we enjoy being able to drive to the store and buy whatever we want that our little hearts desire. None of us have ever had to live in a cave. None of us have ever had to kill a goat and take its skin just so we could cover ourselves. They wandered in deserts. I suspect most of us have never had to do that unless we were on a hiking trip and it was just for a day that we were wandering to a campsite. And in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these having obtained a good report through faith. Who do you want to say to you, well done, the world around you as you compromise with it, or the Lord Jesus Christ as you stand before him in heaven? These all received a good report. through faith. But notice what it says in the last phrase of verse 39, received not the promise. They went through all of that and never got the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. I think it's highly significant that we note that you and I, who are to be included in the list of the heroes of faith, we do not show up until verse 40 after it has already talked about those who have suffered for walking by faith. Dear friends, the Word of God is not designed to scare us. It's designed to give us God's great and precious promises that no matter what this world brings to us, it is by the permissive will and in really all cases, by the directive will of God, so that we might have sin purged from our lives and that we might be molded into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why God gives us certain victories. That's why God gives us certain pressures. Because as a goldsmith refining his gold, he allows the fire to get hotter and hotter until the dross and the dregs of our life bubble to the surface and he can skim it off. And then he sees his image reflected in the purified gold. And he does it because he loves us, not because he hates us, not because he's, you know, upset with us, though he does chasten us as a father. One more phrase here. Our time is coming to a close. We see the, the light. It says it's a light from heaven. We notice a number of things about this light from heaven. It was a focused light. It didn't shine all over the countryside. It says, Paul says, that the light shone on him and those round about him. 
It was like a spotlight. It was a light that had purpose to it. It didn't happen in the night. It says at noonday, that means at 12 o'clock noon, high rise of the sun, in the brightest part of the day, in one of the brightest parts of the world, a light focused so strongly on Saul that by physical force it knocked him off his horse and to the ground. That is a powerful light. A light that can be distinguished, making sunlight look like darkness. It was a light out of which someone spoke. It was a light that Saul, as an observant Jew, would have recognized and understood what that light was. It was a light from which God had spoken in the past to Moses on Mount Sinai. It was a light from which God had spoken in the past to the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. It was the Shekinah glory of God that shone on Paul and his traveling companions at that moment. It was the Shekinah glory of God which had rested on Solomon's temple and had driven the priests out from serving. It was the Shekinah glory of God which had rested on the temple in Ezekiel's day and the glory departed as it moved from the temple where it was over the Holy of Holies to the courtyard, to the pinnacle of the temple where it paused and then when it moved across the desert the valley, the Kidron Valley, to the top of the Mount of Olives and disappeared into the Judean wilderness. Saul knew what the scriptures taught about the glory of God, the Shekinah. Shekinah means the dwelling place, the residence of God, the place where God's throne is located. And suddenly a voice comes out and says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? What a shock. Saul thought he was doing the will of God. And here is God speaking to him from the Shekinah. And he trembling you can imagine him shaking on the ground. Have you ever had tremors so bad you could not stop them? He is trembling on the ground and astonished. And he says, Who art thou, Lord? And so that there is no mistake, there was not a vague voice that came out and said, I'm the grand architect of the universe. There was not a voice that came out and said generally, I'm God, you know, you know who God is, right? The voice said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. He had to admit that's what he was doing. There was no escape from the accusation that is coming from the throne of the judge. What were you on your way to Damascus to do? Catch Christians. Who are Christians? Those are people who believe in Jesus. And so as you catch those Christians, who are you really after? Jesus. I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. In other words, Saul, what you're doing is a very stupid thing. It's something that is personally damaging you. That's the ox goads that make the ox go forward. And he didn't want to go the way that the ox goads were prodding him. And so Jesus stood in the way and spoke to him from the Shekinah glory. Back for a moment to that passage in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, 
and his train filled the temple. We find the cherubim surrounding him. We find the seraphim worshiping him and crying, Holy, 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 the burning ones, seraphim. And Isaiah says, Woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, if you've been with us on Sunday morning, you know to whom those two titles belong. They belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Who did Isaiah see? He saw Christ in Isaiah chapter 6. The pre-incarnate Christ, to be sure, but nonetheless the second person of the Godhead, for no man has seen the Father at any time. The only begotten which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath revealed him. John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. We know that's the case because John says so in John chapter 12, quoting that passage in Isaiah chapter 6, and says that it refers to Jesus Christ. And so Paul experiences the same thing on the road to Damascus. As he is thrown off his horse by light, it knocks him flat to the ground, and Jesus is the one who speaks to him from the Shekinah glory. That's powerful. When Jesus reveals himself, notice what Paul says. Lord, are the first words out of his mouth, Lord. His life has just taken a 180 degree turn. Before this moment, he was cursing the name of Christ. He was pursuing the believers. He was capturing believers and seeing that they were put to death. And suddenly, groveling at the feet of Jesus, he calls him Lord. From being the arrogant, proud know-it-all, he becomes the one who knows of himself as the chief of sinners. Lord, and then the question, what wilt thou have me to do? It's interesting, he'd never asked that question before. He didn't ask that question as he stood holding the coats during the stoning of Stephen. He didn't ask that question before he went to the high priests to get the letters to Damascus. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He didn't ask that question as he gathered the contingency that traveled with him to Damascus. He didn't spend time in prayer asking that question, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He didn't spend time studying the Old Testament scriptures to see if the claims of Jesus met those passages which spoke of the coming Messiah and ask, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He didn't ask that question as he started out on his journey. He didn't ask that question as he traveled along the way, thinking about the Christians that were up there in Damascus. He didn't ask that question when he was in good health and strength and not yet blind. He didn't ask that question while he thought he was in control. He didn't ask that question while he was pursuing his own goals and purposes. He only asked that question when God smacked him down on a dirt road almost to his goal. How often do we go through life with our own purposes, without having asked that question, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? How often do we go through life while we're perfectly strong and healthy and well, 
And before we begin to have the vicissitudes of old age and the weaknesses and the, the frailties that we experience, before we ask that question, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Rather interesting. God could have hit him with that light while he was in Jerusalem, but he didn't. God could have hit him with that light as he was on the road just outside of Jerusalem. And stopped him early on in his tracks. God waited until he was almost to Damascus. He had traveled over rugged territory for many days before God hit him with the light. You know, God does that often in our lives too. We're out of the will of God. We haven't prayed about what we're going to do. We haven't checked it out to make sure that it is in compliance with scripture. We haven't sought the counsel of the Lord through prayer. We haven't asked, God, what do you want me to do? Instead, we've gone our own way. And the Lord has let us go. And he's let us go. And he's let us go. And he's let us go. Until we almost reached the goal that we thought was the goal that God wanted for our lives, though we hadn't checked it with him first. And then God hits us with something. And God says, okay, go ahead and reach the goal. But we get there blind. God says, I'll let you know, but you have to wait. And Saul sat around for three days blind before God told him what to do. And then he had to make the journey back. That same miserable 150 miles, which could have been avoided if he had first checked with God what God wanted him to do. I think the Lord allows us to go through experiences like that so that he can teach us a lesson, so that we will never again do the things that we thought we were doing for God, but what we had not checked out with him. Notice something else about his question. Lord, what wilt thou have me do? He didn't ask the question, Lord, what wilt thou have me believe? That's the question that most of us are most worried about. We want to make sure that our doctrine is in its little box, and exactly so, so that we can fit into reformed circles. But we then assume that that's enough. We've got our doctrine, and it's in its box and we carry it under our arm and we show it to everybody who asks us questions about it. Saul didn't ask the question, Lord, what wilt thou have me believe? He was a theologian. He had studied the feet of Gamaliel. He thought he had all his ducks in a row. But he suddenly discovered that theology had never changed his life in the way that God wanted it changed. Oh, it had changed his life. It had made him into a pious hypocrite. But it had not transformed him into a man of God. Truth truly believed from the heart and not intermixed with the theologies of the world will bring about a changed life. And that's what happened to Saul. He understood suddenly that all those things that he knew in his head about the God of the Old Testament, about the God of light and the God of holiness, and the one who spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, and the one who spoke to Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, and that magnificent picture of the Shekinah glory in the book of Ezekiel, he knew all the theology, but he hadn't bothered to check out the claims of Christ. Dear people, until you truly know Jesus Christ, it is not enough to know theology. 
So many men graduate from seminary and they know theology. They can tell you all about church history. They can tell you all about superlapsarianism and infralapsarianism and lapsarianism and they can talk about the Pelagian controversies and they can talk about the errors of Augustine and the good points of Augustine and they can tell you all about Calvin and what his doctrine is and what's in the institutes. They can tell you all about modern theologians, Schleiermacher and Karl Barth and all those guys. But until they have come in contact, a personal contact with the living Christ, and he has changed their life, the theology means nothing. Have you come in contact with the resurrected Christ? Has what you have believed in your head traveled 18 inches south and reached your heart? Is your life being transformed by the Spirit of God and by the Word of God into the image of Christ, where you no longer fear what the world will do unto you? But your one goal in life, regardless of what happens, is to stand at the foot of Jesus and hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power and how we thank you for how you work in the lives of men and women and boys and girls. How we thank you, Father, for your grace in the times when we are not walking as we should, in the times when we are desperately wanting our own things and our own way, and thinking that you will put your stamp of approval on what we want. Father, I pray that we might not go so far as Saul did on the road to Damascus before you hit us with your light. Help us to constantly, day by day, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And then by your Spirit, through the Word of God, as we study it, give us clear direction a direction filled with faith and not with fear. We praise you, Father, for calling Saul and redirecting his energy so that we might have our New Testament today. What you can do with a man or a woman who has decided no longer to walk their own way, but to walk in total obedience to you, the one who is the Lord, the master, the one who gives the directions, the one who gives the commands, the one who expects us to obey. Apply the scripture to each of our hearts, Father, for it is your word, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.